Good morning. How many enjoyed the balmy week of weather we had? <laughs> yeah. And it's back to February. <laughs> it's wel welcome. It's good to see each and every one of you. If you could just take a seat, today is kind of an unusual Sunday. And uh, it's different from all the other uh, 51 Sundays out of the year. In this Sunday, we actually share a lot of information and not just telling you about what God has done in other people's lives, but letting them tell some of that story as well. And so we have some videos that I'd like you to uh, just watch. We're going to intersperse them throughout our time together today. And um, so we'll, we'll kind of walk through this process together. If you just turn your attention to the screen this morning. So we hadn't been to a church in a long time, and um, we decided to try Calvary because it's right across from our house. Um, and we had heard that you guys had um, Wednesdays, uh, something for kids that was more than just playtime. It was the word and getting involved. And so we had read about it online and we thought we'll give it a shot. And I prayed that whole day um, for Sophia, my daughter, because she's a very much an introvert and doesn't do well in spaces where she has to kind of flourish on her own. Yeah, so on the, on the ride home with um, Sophia, she was not stop talking about how she wasn't even nervous and how she loved it and she wanted to stay here forever and it was just such a good feeling to feel like after all these years of trying to find somewhere where she kind of molded into that she felt safe and like felt that she belonged somewhere and, and wanted to actually go back and was looking forward to to doing it again so that was great i think when when sophia expressed that that Calvary to her felt like a safe place and that she felt home, we, you know, we pretty much didn't look back. She really thrives from, from actually learning and she loves God so much. You know, she has such a huge passion for Jesus that it's, it's such, it's a, I can definitely see how Calvary has really cultivated that more that she wouldn't be getting if she weren't coming here. Amen. Well, one of the things that we value the most around here is our children and our teenagers. Uh, we invest a lot into them, not just financially, but we have over 150 volunteers who serve throughout the month to invest in our youngest people, the people who Jesus valued so much, we value so much. And so I just want to take a minute, and can we just celebrate all of our volunteers, specifically who are investing in our kids and our teenagers. We appreciate you so much. We are so grateful for you. And to all the kids and youth who are in the room, we want you to know something. We don't think of you as the next generation, like you need to wait your turn. You are the now generation. You are the church. We believe in you. God has great things in store for you, not 20 years from now, but today. And so we just want to say we are proud of you. We believe in you. Jesus loves you, and he has a plan for you. Can I get an amen and some claps up in here for our kids that we are celebrating? Yes. Well, this morning, it is Vision Sunday, and it's our first time ever doing something like this. We're combining our business meeting into our service, talking about what God has done and celebrating that, as well as looking forward to what we believe God has for our future. And so we are just so excited about that this morning. This is going to be an interactive morning. This is going to be a morning if you hear something, or you see something that moves you, clap your hands, say amen. We're going to, we're going to get it going up in here this morning. And uh, you can just think, what would Jonathan do? And then you can be, be, be about half that loud. <laughs> um, but we are, we are just really, really excited for this morning and what God is doing in people's lives. So if you hear a testimony at the end of the video, if you want to clap uh, or, or any time throughout, uh, don't, don't shy away from that. We're excited for this morning. If you could do me a favor and fill, take this green card out in the seat back in front of you, um, it's a great way for us to be able to connect with you and to know what's going on in your life. If this is your first time here this morning, we're so excited that you're here for our Vision Sunday. Um, what a great time to come and visit us today. 
Um, but I wanted to let everybody who comes every week know something about these cards is they're not just for connection and, and so that we can pray with you and for you, um, which is their primary purpose. But the reason we have everybody fill it out every week is so that um, since we've got a light auditorium and you can see what's happening and what's going on, we have everybody fill it out so that somebody who's new doesn't stand out and feel like, hey, I'm the only one doing it, so it, it's really clear that I'm the newbie in the room. It's a way for us to be hospitable to our guests. And so you filling this card every, every, out every week doesn't just enable us to know you are here or to connect with you in prayer, their primary purpose, but it also allows um, us to be able to be more hospitable to the person who's just walking in. So if you could fill out this connection card this week and even in the weeks when we call for that, um, we'd really deeply appreciate that this morning. This morning, our teenagers are gonna be staying in service since we have a special morning planned. Um, but our kids, uh, you are going to be released for your classes. Right after that, we're going to show two more testimonies of God and his faithfulness. Can we give a round of applause for our kids as they head out to their classes? We're so proud of you guys and excited for you. Would you turn your attention to the screens here? I'm Rachel and I've been coming to Calvary for about a year. Um, I felt for the first year really that I've been attending to Calvary that I just didn't really know anyone. And then Jonathan Sigmund actually turned around and said, hey, you should join the worship team. And this fall, I was encouraged to join the worship team. So I got plugged in there as well as with the small group led by Ben and Morgan. Uh, we have texting groups and things like that. And if I need anything, I've been feeling open to text anyone that I need to ask for prayer. And I've had some really rough times where I've just come in and cried. <laughs> and they've really helped me through that, too. I've really always struggled with academics. I just, school's not my thing. But music therapy is a passion of mine. And so I know I have to get through the school portion of it to actually get to the job portion. And I've always gotten horrible grades. Uh, and last semester, I actually got straight A's for the first time in my whole life. So, and I think that's definitely a lot to do with the encouragement that I've gotten from my small group and having just so many friends praying for me at one time. And it really encouraged me and gave me the motivation that I've actually never had. When we had first found out uh, that he was in the hospital, uh, my mom had said, you know, he has an infection in his foot, um, but we're not sure what we're gonna do. Um, so, of course, immediately, because they're not forthcoming with pertinent information sometimes, uh, you have to pry a little bit with them. And uh, so I ended up going down there to here, and I got there right at the right time when the doctor was there and said the infection was pretty bad. And, uh, of course, my first reaction was, he's going to lose, you know, a foot. And when I immediately went into panic mode, like, how am I going to take care of my dad's daily chores? What would I have to do if he loses a foot to make his house accommodating because I can build something for him? Uh, so it was a lot of crazy emotions swirling to you know, really figure out what exactly I needed to do to help him. So my wife had contacted Linda Thompson uh, to let her know uh, what exactly was happening. And she contacted the church uh, and asked for the elders to start a prayer chain, and they did. She had posted something uh, on the prayer wall, uh, which I thought was wonderful. And that, that touched me, uh, that, that she would do such you know, a wonderful thing uh, to help out a situation with my dad. And uh, it, it just it was very touching for all of us. Through, through, uh, through this whole ordeal, uh, worst case scenario, he was gonna lose a foot. Uh, looked like more definitely it was gonna be his big toe. But the, I believe in my heart that the prayer chain somehow got the surgeon in contact with this disease specialist uh, to look at my dad moments before his surgery uh, for basically a second opinion on it. And um, you know, he said, let's not do the amputation. Let's remove as much of the infection we can and let's see if you know, his body can heal it. 
they kept looking at it, and the swelling's gone, the redness is gone, and they keep looking at this for every day saying, I can't believe this. We did get good news, they are not going to amputate now, uh, which is awesome, and uh, he's on, on the mend. Praise God. You know, it just, it, it brings uh, tears to me, uh, tears of joy more than anything. Aren't you glad we have a God who actually cares, and he actually hears, and he actually answers when we call out to him? This morning, we're going to take you through quite a bit of information, and so I want to start with uh, this verse. It says in 1 Corinthians 4, now it is required for those who have been given a, a, a trust must, what's the next word? Prove faithful. So how do you do that? How do you prove that you've been faithful with what you have been trusted with? And we think that you have to reveal what you've been trusted with and what you did with it. So we're going to show quite a bit of information this morning. Uh, the first is this, is that uh, when, you know, when we came uh, 19 years ago, there were less than 20 people who were part of this church family. This attendance chart just shows what the last 12 years have looked like. Um, the good news is, is that out of the 19 years, we've had 17 years in that 19-year uh, span, 17 years of growth. People come here on a weekend, and they trust us with their time, and they trust us to provide a healthy and well-balanced spiritual diet. In 2016, we actually saw a little over a 9% increase in those who were attending on the weekend worship opportunities. And that little booklet that you were given on the way in, there's a page that says, Saved People Serve People. We don't just count people who show up, and we don't just count the dollars that are given. We also count a number of other things. For example, 456, I want you to think about this, 456 people in the course of 2016 actually volunteered their time, and they donated 13,480 hours. If we were paying even minimum wage for that kind of work, it would cost us over $131,000 more than we already spent this last year. And for 75 of those people, it was their first time ever, ever serving in the Calvary Ministries and using their gifts to help others. And by the way, yes, we count everything. We even count how many donuts are consumed. Last year, 12,480 donuts. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. 4,386 bagels, not 85, 86 bagels, 11,648 cups of coffee were drank in the lobby and in the auditorium of this place. And here's what I want you to know. That is not just about calories. It's about conversations. Something happens when you're holding a styrofoam cup in one hand and a donut in the other. You have a conversation with someone. And God uses that snack to create a space for you to get to notice someone else a little bit better. This is also some information related to our contributions last year. Last year, you contributed into the Calvary Ministries $832,823. How many think that's a lot of money? If you do not think that's a lot of money, I need to see you right after the service. Uh, if you're looking in your booklet, there's a page called Consumer to Contributor. $811,580 of that was given through tithes and offerings. Let me explain why that's so important. Because these contributions are made by individuals who aren't waiting for a crisis or a cause to motivate them to contribute. They understand that the accumulated influence of a church family week after week in a community changes real lives. And you made that contribution. Over $12,500 was contributed to support 
are missionaries, people who have a single and passionate purpose of making sure that no matter what your ethnicity, no matter your geographical location, no matter your educational status, no matter how much money you will ever make or not make, that nothing should ever serve as a barrier between you and the grace of God. And just so you know, while they contributed over $13,000, or, or just almost $13,000, we actually gave out uh, over uh, $24,000. We almost gave twice as much as what came in just for those missions. In fact, uh, this is what I'd like you to do. Just look at some of our missionaries saying thank you this morning. Hello, Rochester, New York, Calvary Assembly. This is Shelly Carl and Lynn and Bob Rose. Hi, we're Doug and Jackie Rock. Dwayne and Lori, Justice and Jared Danielson. We're the Garrisons. We're the Lenaways. Leslie Latona here. Hi, this is Terry. This is Liz Ramos. Paul and Julie Krauss. Phil. Lisa Devesta. We're Stephen, Joe McCarthy and family serving in Uruguay and South America. And we want to say thank you for your generosity. We are so thankful for you. And we just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for your prayer support. And we appreciate our support and your partnership. Thank you, Calvary Assembly. I just want to say thank you for your investment. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your faithful support. Thanks, Calvary Assembly, for helping us reach the youth in Asia. Your support of Aki's Place has had a huge impact on the nation of Bangladesh. Thank you so much for your generous support that is helping me to actually start a new church, Tokyo Blessing Church. Two weeks ago, six people got baptized because of you were getting married. Thank you. We're taking the gospel to Muslims and other unreached people groups here in the metro region. Where we rescue girls who have been uh, trapped in trafficking. Lives are being transformed here in Belize. We are grateful to you for all that you do in partnering with us. And that's just a portion of the missionaries that we support. And by the way, the over $24,000 that was included in that missions amount doesn't include the almost $11,000 that you contributed to go to Aki's place, where children are being taken care of. Their parents have been, moms have been involved in the sex slave industry, and they have no future. They are not only given a place, safe place to live, they are given food, they are given clothing, they are given education, they're taught English as a second language, and they will even cover them into college. You paid an entire year for that ministry last year, and that's not even included in the $24,000 that we just talked about. How many are grateful that God can multiply our resources and make a difference with them? You also contributed $3,860 for benevolence. This is what it says in James, the second chapter. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but no deeds... Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, just finish this question with me. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. There are people who run into a financial crisis. They're not asking for lifetime support. They just need help to get through a setback. By the way, we actually gave away to people in a difficult situation over $7,225. Once again, almost twice as much as what was contributed. Here's an example of just one person's experience in receiving some of those contributions. Last summer, I ended up unexpectedly losing my job. And when we moved up into this area, and I just happened to pass by this church, and you were, that weekend you were going to have your family fun day outside. So I told the girls, you know what, let's give this one a try. And since day one, everybody that I have met has welcomed all three of us in. Um, it wasn't until somebody here at church asked if I had talk to the pastor and the church elders about whether or not they could help, and it had never occurred to me to do so. Um, so I took her up on it, and Emily met me at the door, 
and led me into the office with Gabe and we just went over what my situation was, what's going on. And I lost my job. You know, I have no money coming into the house. We're about to be evicted. We're about to have our car taken. And I'm in a desperate situation. And someone at the church referred me to ask if there's anything that the church could do to help. So that was it. Just got the ball rolling and next thing I know my rent's being paid for, my car's being paid for. My family helped buy groceries. I be you know, the same family has helped me with car rides to back and forth to work. Um, and it just helped it kept me from absolutely losing everything and ending up on the street pretty much. We're still employed, we're still in our home and we still have a car. We have food in the house and bills are paid. And that's all God's grace and mercy. She was this close to homeless and with her two teenage daughters. And what I want you to know is, like, this wasn't just writing a check, though we were happy to do that. There were people in our church that helped her brush up her resume. She was applying for a part-time job. The resume looked so good, they actually offered her a full-time job. Uh, it is. It's amazing. When she didn't have access to her car, one of our church families saw her walking to work. And uh, they just picked her up and started giving her a ride until they could arrange to get the car back. I want to thank you so much for making a difference in real people's lives. This is how it actually happens. Over 150,000 of your contributions went directly into ministry. Over 16,000 just to take care of our children, which are incredibly precious treasures that God has entrusted to us. Over $18,000 to our students to help them develop a confident faith so that they can live out their faith in a way that is not only confident in how they live it out, but contagious in the way that they share it. By the way, if you want to see how that is lived out in their lives, you show up here next Sunday and you will be astonished at what God is doing in the life of our students. This is something new for us. Over 36% of all the contributions that came in in 2016 actually came in electronically, online, text to give, or through our phone app. What we discovered is that people really want to be generous, but you have to provide convenient options for them. And so we have been able to do that, and that has helped us enormously. And your contributions enable us to hire staff. Uh, to help lead and direct the ministries of our church. Our staff is accountable for how they use their time. By the way, in 2016, five full-time staff, seven part-time staff, one paid internship. And we actually not only track the amount of money we spend on staff, we track how they use their time and how that money is being used for ministry. So we can actually see how much of their salary went to things like helping reach people who are far from God or providing pastoral care for someone who's going through a crisis, or helping someone take the next step in their growth and development in their faith, or even in helping to train and develop leadership in someone's life. That chart shows you how our staff dollars are actually spent. So all of this and more was accomplished by the $823,000 that you gave. What do you say we just thank God for all of his faithfulness in all of that? Amen. By the way, yes, there is more. We knew that we had to resurface our lot, put a top coat on it. It was deteriorating. And if you let it go too long, it'll cost twice as much to fix. $92,625 for pavement. I can't tell you how hard it is for a pastor to say that's how we spent money. But what I will tell you is, is that our council knew that day was coming. And every year we set money aside into savings. So when that day came, we didn't have to come and cut other ministries or ask for even more contributions to be able to do that. And so the day came and we had the money in the bank and we paid for it. Didn't have to ask for another dime from anybody. But as a council, when we got together, we just felt terrible that over $92,000 went to pavement. There's so much we could do in ministry. So we decided to do a little creative idea. We decided to treat that $92,000 as an internal loan. We would write the check to go out to the pavement, but then we would pay ourselves that money back over time so we could put it into ministry. And here's what I want you to know. We set up a payment plan over several years 
what I can tell you is we were able to pay that entire 92000 plus amount back in 2016. That's included in the $832,000. And we even were able to add a sound system. So now some of you actually understand what it is that I'm saying. We don't know if this is a good thing or not, but we're trying it. Uh, the church has grown very well with the mumbled sounds you've heard from me. And, uh, but we've had a lot of positive feedback. We paid back over $92,000 on the parking lot. We installed a new sound system. And are you ready for this? We still had $23,296 left over at the end of 2016. Is that not amazing? So what about 2017? Well, we have a plan. We honestly believe that God wants to continue to trust us with resources, and we want to use them as wisely as we possibly can. So this is our plan. We plan on spending $212,100 on our facility. That includes our mortgage. That includes all the maintenance. That includes all our utilities. It includes our insurance. Everything that we need in order to keep this facility in safe and excellent order. And by the way, you don't ever hear me refer to this place as the church. You are the church. This is a facility that facilitates the church getting together and the ministries that we do. Office is going to be about $42,350, in case you don't know. That includes all of our equipment. That includes all of our postage, all of our printing. Uh, that's a fairly uh, expensive project over the course of an entire year. $155,253 directly into ministry. This is how we take care of our children and our students and our men and our women and our seniors and our missionaries. That's all included in there. And we have 26,502 missions. What we've, what you've already seen from last year, everything that comes in goes out, and we give even more than that. And $399,236 to payroll. And that might sound like a lot of money to you. What I want you to know in 2017, that will cover 13 employees and one paid internship. We actually track the percentages over to, compared to our overall budget, and we go to people who are experts in fiscal responsibility and nonprofit organizations to find out if we are in the ballpark that we should be in. And what I can proudly say to you is that our percentages for what is devoted to payroll in our organization is actually a little bit less than you would typically see in most nonprofits. We get a lot of bang for the buck in terms of compensation. Now, when I throw a number up there like that, a lot of times there's some questions about who makes how much. And what I want you to know is that we never disclose the individual compensation of any employee of Calvary Assembly because we want to respect their right to that information maintaining privacy. I'll tell you two things that you need to know about that. First of all, our church council goes through every detail of all compensation packages and they are intimately aware of it and they've had to approve of it before it can move forward. Secondly, is that I do think it is appropriate if you want to know what I make, you are more than welcome to that information. Every year in this meeting, I bring my W-2, and it is on the front row. And if you want to know exactly what I make, it is available for you to see. If you think that I make too much, then you can keep that to you. Uh, you can go to uh, the, no, no. I got that backwards. Let me fix that. If you think I make too much, you can go to council and complain. Maybe they'll fix it. If you think I make too little, you can keep that to yourself. Oh. Yep. <clears throat> Next year, we'll have a blooper reel for this. And the budget for 2017 actually represents, it's $835,439. It actually represents an only 1% increase over 2016, what our contributions were. If we have more money than that comes in, I want you to know we have a plan for that, just like we did last year when we had more than enough money. And if we get less than we expect, we have a plan for that too, so that not a single dime is lost in the ministry that we do to the most precious and needy people that we serve. 
Every one of our ministry budgets puts together a three-option budget. And the first option is what we absolutely need in order to provide ministry. The second option is what we need to grow this ministry. And the third option is if we could dream and cast vision, what would we want and need to be able to keep moving forward. And so all of those are part of our budget plan. So our budget is a plan. What I can tell you is, is if you doubled the amount of income that was given to this church, you would not yet exceed the vision of this house. We have plans for every dollar that God will ever give to us, and it will be used wisely, and it will make a difference in the lives of people. That's our commitment to you. So what do you say we express appreciation to God for all of his faithfulness to us? Amen. And just before we go on to the next section, one more quick video for you this morning. When I came here, I thought I was only here to serve. So I knew nothing about the church. And even the motto of the church was very confusing to me. I had no concept of what safe meant. But even asking the pastor about it and actually asking people about what they thought safe was, I realized that safe wasn't just the logistics of, of things that I could see. It was the fact that who you are can come to this church and be who you are. This is the first time in 15 years I'm finding me and who God wants me to be, and it's okay just to be me. So SAFE has been life-changing, and as odd as it may sound, I actually use it now. I tell people this is a safe place because I know they can walk in those doors in whatever state they're in and just find a path to reconnect to God. But through the leadership, through the people, through just being in this environment, I've changed to the point where people who see me from even a year ago are like, what did you do? You're looking so good. Um, but not only have I gotten to see my life get transformed, but it's affected my husband too, who's also working here, and it's completely restored our marriage. We were fighting, we weren't talking, um, we were short with each other, and just in this past year, we've been completely restored to the point where like, we're like honeymooners again. Somebody even asked if we just got married, because we're just, just rediscovering each other again with so much love and forgiveness and openness and, and freedom that we haven't had in such a long time. We we're doing dates, we've never done that before. We're actually going on dates, and we're spending time with each other and getting to know each other again. So being at Calvary has really taken our marriage from a place of being constantly frustrated and tired and aggravated with one another to actually being able to to And um, I don't know, everything that I've been through has made us who we are today, and I believe God's going to use it. And now I know what being part of a community and a family is like, and I really like it. <laughs> so I'm excited about what God can use me for to help others. And I'm not afraid of the future anymore, which is awesome. <laughs> If you are a member of our church family, if you didn't pick it up on the way in, please make sure you do on the way out. There's an envelope that has your name on it, and inside that envelope is a ballot, and that ballot is how we are selecting the next person that will serve on our church council. So make sure that you pick that up and cast that ballot before you leave here today so that we can uh, follow through on your selection for the next uh, council uh, position. In Acts, the second chapter, it said, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, and they broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. There was something incredibly organic about the life and growth of that first church. The first church did not try to become an exclusive club that was only available to the original founding members. And they never tried to intimidate people to become part of their church family. And they never tried to intimidate people to keep from becoming part of that church family. They simply believed that the more lives that were transformed by the grace of God, the more there was to celebrate. And they did. Well, last year I shared a couple of things that were important points of passion in our own heart and things that we were hoping to accomplish. And the first had to do with deaf ministry. And uh, in case you don't know, Rochester has the second highest per capita population of uh, deaf in the, of any town or city in the United States of America. And yet there is not a, a, a deaf church or a deaf assembly for them to worship at. We're very grateful for every church that provides the option. 
but we started conversations with the folks that were in our deaf community here as part of our membership. And uh, we discovered that uh, it's very easy for hearing people to assume to know how to help. And uh, what we needed to do was to start with a lot of questions and a lot of listening. That has been so helpful to us. As a result of those conversations, we still have a long-range plan to make a difference in the deaf community in Rochester. But one of the things that we've started with is closed captioning. Our messages are now available online with closed captioning, so anybody who's in the Rochester community can access teaching from God's Word. The second thing is that we've actually launched a deaf life group. So they get together and they're getting to know each other better. There's even a person who lives in the Carolinas that has no access to a church that provides ministry to deaf people and they actually Skype in. They have their little iPads set up and that person is part of the conversation just for the deaf community. And we don't think we've even scratched the surface as to what God wants to do in that community at Rochester at large. A second area that we've talked about was launching a second campus. And we did a lot of work on this since my last conversation with you. We began to research possible locations. We began to recruit and interview people who would be a campus pastor. We didn't want this to be a video venue where my image was videoed in. We wanted to actually have a live pastor present at that campus so that they could uh, serve the needs of the congregation that were there. And uh, we accessed uh, training and experts who do this kind of second campus and multiple campus option all of the time. And our church council and staff got together for a very significant conversation about this. And in that conversation, we gained an incredible sense of new clarity, not only just about what we wanted to do, but about some blind spots we had to some of the challenges we were facing in our current ministries. I have never seen a conversation where there was so much freedom to discuss and so little private agenda. It was one of the most breathtaking conversations you could ever be a part of. And what we realized is that we were definitely passionate about pursuing a second campus, but there were a couple other priorities we needed to take care of first. So we're still going to do the second campus, but it's just going to take us a little bit longer than when we had originally uh, thought. Uh, most of you would not have recognized what our church looked like 19 years ago. Uh, we had less than 20 people in a tiny little facility, uh, half of which was not even usable. We only had 26 parking spaces. And when uh, I became pastor here, on every bulletin there was a vision statement that was included in every bulletin. The vision of Calvary Assembly at that time was for us to be a spiritual hospital so people could find healing and wholeness. And while that sounds very good, I went to the council and I asked them, I said, do you think it's possible that we're sending an unintended message with that vision statement? And they said, well, like what? I said, well, let me ask you, how many people want to go to a hospital? <laughs> In fact, the only reason you ever go to a hospital is because you have to. And then as soon as you feel better, what do you do? I said, so our vision statement is don't come here unless you absolutely have to, and as soon as you feel better, go someplace else. And I said, that might explain why we have less than 20 people here. I don't know. Could be. So I said, let's scrap that, and let's spend some time seeking God for what he wants our church family to become. We spent the next year studying scripture and praying and imagining what God might want to do through this tiny little community of faith. And we tried as best we could to hear the whispers of God's Spirit to our hearts. And out of that came this idea that this would be a safe place for people to find faith, to find friends, and to find their future. We had no idea back then how powerful this vision would become. This was before 9-11. This was before the economic crisis. This was before a world that was becoming increasingly anxious with the random acts of violence and terror that, that show itself in every community. And we wanted, uh, God knew this all in advance, and he wanted people to know that there is a safe place that you can go where you can discover who God is and you can discover who he intended you to be. So little by little, year by year, God brought more individuals and more families for us to be able to serve. We went in that tiny little building from one service to two services to three services. My 
office was also the conference room. It was the adult classroom. It was the girls' ministry room. It was the room where we would set up food when we were having an eating event together. And it was also the nursery on Sunday mornings. We multi-purposed every square foot. We remodeled that facility so that we could make the lower level safe for children's ministry, and we added an office down there and even some space for fellowship. And there are moments that are incredibly etched in my mind about that place, but one of the most powerful actually took place right outside of that window. Our church council members got together on a February Sunday, and we drove our cars. This property was for sale. And we drove our cars, and we parked them across the street, and we walked across the street, and we stood knee-deep in snow that day, and we prayed an incredibly bold prayer. We asked God if he would help us to obtain this property, that we would always be generous with it and how we shared it with other people, and we would try to help other people discover how gracious and good that he really was. And how we obtained this property is a miracle story in and of itself, and I don't have time to tell you. But I can tell you that God answered that incredibly bold prayer, and we have tried to be faithful to the promise we made that day. Our uh, facilities get used throughout the week. Things like lifetime assistance, a lot of their training actually occurs in this facility for their staff. We've done blood drives. You can get flu shots here, Boy Scouts, homeschool groups, scrapbookers, other churches. There was a church who a prominent member of their church family had passed away. They could not seat the number of people they needed for the funeral, and they called and asked if they could use our place. We said, absolutely, and so they came here. Three times our church has been used by another church for weddings. There was one pastor's son. They didn't have any place to go for a reception. We just took all the chairs out, set up tables, and had a reception so that his wedding day could be joyous. And in case you don't know, um, when we hired uh, Steve, we didn't have an office for him. Pastor Steve is pastor of our children's ministry. We didn't have an office for him, so we converted the utility room in the children's wing. For the longest time, it still had a sink, a utility sink in there. We finally got rid of that. But he, we, he, he had a, now he has an office. Then when we hired uh, Jordan, we didn't have an office for him either, so we converted the conference room into an office. And then when we hired Ben, didn't have an office for him either, and so we, we hauled the, co the copier out of that office, and, and now he's got the copy room. And by the way, my office is undergoing a remodel right now so that we will have space for all of our nursing mothers to go and feel safe and comfortable as they care for their infants because we've run out of space in our nursery. Right now, in, in addition to all of the babies we have around here, we've got four moms pregnant with five children, and they need some place to go. Some things never change. God's heart never changes. He's thoroughly dissatisfied when people haven't experienced his grace. His passion to reach and connect with people who are making up life on their own, it's unparalleled and it's unwavering. And he comes into their lives and he just washes away their shame and their guilt. And he shows them how breathtakingly, astonishingly beautiful their life can be if they dare to trust him with it. That never changes. So we're honored that God would use our church family to help extend that grace to others. And I want you to know, we don't think for one minute that we're the only church in our community. We're not. I'm grateful for every spiritual shepherd and every pastor who teaches God's word and cares for God's people week after week after week, year after year in our community. We are not in competition with other churches. We, when we were going before the town board to build this facility, uh, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but right, right over there, there's a church called Anchor Church. And so we were going to be moving into their neighborhood. Their pastor showed up at the town board to speak on behalf of our church acquiring this property and building this facility. He said, we think that there's plenty of need for there to be space for people in our community to connect with God, and we support this. By the way, their church is growing too. So when they were recently before the town board for an expansion project on their facility, I was more than happy to show up there and say, I think this is a phenomenal idea to have a place where families can be cared for 
and where their values can be reinforced and they can be supported. This is a healthy and good thing in our community. There are so many people in our community who are trying to figure out life on their own, and they've not yet experienced for themselves the grace of God. We could fill every single church in our community many times over. I know that there are some people who are concerned that our culture is no longer interested in spiritual things. I want you to hear from me. I could not disagree with that anymore. I see people who are hungry and starving for the grace of God. They are tired and they desire his strength in their lives. They're confused and they want his wisdom to be able to figure out how to make life work. The church at large has more opportunity right now than any time it's ever had in its 2,000 year history and I am thrilled to be a part of it. Can somebody say amen? The grace of God is not fading into human history. It's growing ever brighter every single day, like a sun until it comes to its full strength. I honestly believe the best is yet to come. I really do. I really do. So God is at work. He's doing some incredibly awesome things, one heart at a time, one life at a time, one family at a time. He's transforming our world. I don't pretend that I know all that God intends to do in the future of our church family, but I do know if we could see it, it would do two things to us. It would make us humble, and it would inspire us. Yesterday, I officiated a wedding right here in this room, precious couple, and I watched as the bride walked in the back of the room, and I'll tell you one of my pastor secrets. I never look at the bride first. I always look at the groom. It's true. The most priceless expression in the room every time. And when he saw her, the tears just ran down his face. Absolutely thrilled at this life that they were going to build together and the promises they were going to make to each other. And what I want you to know is that's not just for wedding days. I want tears of joy to stream down on our cheeks every single week because we see what the grace of God is doing in people's lives. I want gentle whispers of gratitude to escape from our lips when we see what the grace of God is doing in people's lives. I want shouts to erupt from our innermost being when we see what the grace of God is doing in people's lives. And I want that day after day. And I want that week after week, month after month, year after year. Because it's true. The best is yet to come. Let's stand together this morning.
So a couple of quick things, just a reminder. I'm, I was serious when I said my W-2 is on the front row, and you're more than welcome to look at that before you go. Uh, secondly is if you are a member, please make sure you pick up your envelope and you cast your ballot today. That is a very important part of selecting that next person. Also, um, I do want to say thank you to Jonathan Sigmund and Steve Otto and Jordan Hilke and Ben Longenbaugh for the way that they continue to serve our church family. Could we express our appreciation again? And I would just add one more thanks. Uh, we have a graphics intern from uh, Roberts Wesleyan with us. Um, she's doing her internship um, just as a gift to us, and she put together this whole packet. Her name is Elizabeth Scalron, and if you would give her a round of applause. This is amazing. We are just so grateful for what God is doing. What an amazing morning to celebrate his goodness. We are just so grateful for all of you and for your generosity with your time and with your resources. We don't take any of it for granted, and we are just so, so grateful. So would you stand with us this morning as we close? Others would come forward. We have people who would love to partner with you in prayer. And let's just go to the Lord one more time. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for your generosity for how amazing you are, your grace that invades hearts and changes lives. You're restoring relationships and hearts and souls, and we are here this morning to say thank you, Lord Jesus, for the work that you did on that cross so long ago and the work you continue to do in our hearts and lives today. Jesus, we say thank you, thank you, thank you. We love you, Lord. May we go out empowered by your spirit into the world and tell of your grace and of your goodness. And all who agree with that prayer said amen. 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 Let's give the Lord one more round of applause. Have a great Sunday. God bless you guys.